All right, everyone, it's, it's, it's 101, I think we'll get started. All right, so hello everyone and welcome. I'm Adam Green. Um, before I turn it over to Damien to present the exciting case study on the, the um, Grand Magellan Telescope, I'd like to give you a brief intro into ATA and, and also Star CTM Plus. Um, but even before I do that, a quick few housekeeping notes. Um, initially, everyone has been muted um, and that avoids any background noise or disruptions. Um, and at the end, we'll be able to, you'll be able to unmute yourself um, and ask comments and, or, or share some questions. Um, and so if, if any of you have any questions you want to field during the presentation, um, please send personal notes to either me, Adam Green, or Jonathan Hill as well. Um, both of us will be monitoring the questions. You can see that, that the chat in, in the bottom bar to the right. Um, most of you probably know, well, let's, most of you probably know ATA through our role as a Siemens partner or a reseller and through our robust engineering services. I mean, these two really go hand in hand. We, we've experienced providing engineering services across a wide range of industries, and since we're solving the same issues as our software every day, it allows us to provide excellent support. On the design services side, our focus is on analysis and test-driven design. And ATA is proud to help our customers meet their toughest engineering challenges. From performing ground vibration tests on state-of-the-art aircraft and helping to ensure the safety of theme park attractions to analyzing next-generation aircraft and planetary rovers. Of course, being experts with, with Siemens software, it really helps us do exactly that. I mean, so, Really speaking of the software side, um, this shows a list of the Siemens product lines that we use and can assist you with. And we've recently added EADS at the top there as a, as a new product line that we're working on. Um, and our technical support hotline services is staffed by experienced engineers who use these tools every day. Um, and you can contact these, these, these experts um, either by phone or through our website. In addition, we can also help with, with software sales and licensing um, and offer a variety of classes ranging from PMAP and FEA um, to more advanced subjects like dynamic response and optimization and more. Um, all of these things can be found on our website on, on the bottom right there. And this, this event's being recorded, um, so you'll be able to, to see that um, in, in the recording. And so really diving into the website a little more, um, there's the, 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 the URL at the top, um, and, and really it holds the full list of, of all of those things, up and coming classes, um, and, and the ability to contact our hotline support. And it also has uh, plenty of the product information and brochures that, of, of the software that we support from Siemens. And, and the other part is that, that it's growing, it's got a growing collection of free resources developed via our engineers, um, really to, for our customer needs, including white papers, training videos, um, and other things. And so please, uh, after this webinar, please visit the website and, and investigate those. And if you need any um, additional help with the links, please, please contact us. And so, before we go into a little more detail of Star CTM Plus, I thought it would be good to, to frame how Star CTM Plus looks in the, in the bigger um, Siemens Sim Center portfolio. Um, so the Sim Center portfolio is kind of quite comprehensive in terms of its a suite of simulation software and tests, including FEMAP, NX, and X Nastran, um, that can help you, your company address the engineering challenges of today. Um, Sim Center combines really simulation and physical testing. Um, with intelligent reporting and data analytics to, to really, um, you know, um, enable the, the Siemens vision of digital twins that really actually predict product performance. Um, and really the idea is to, to drive innovation throughout all stages of the, of the design cycle. So within SimSend, the CFD um, is, is, and Star CCM Plus tools is, is a multi-physics tool that really integrates lots of different physics with intelligent design exploration. So we're going to look at a little bit more of that today. Um, but really, that, that um, the combined workflow automation and efficient computing really enables the software to work very quickly um, and enables engineers to conduct analysis and exploration um, of, of real problems on, on real geometries. And resulting in a much better um, design decisions as early as you can in the design process. 
And so obviously we, we've got lots of clients or Siemens do around the world, and one of those is, is, is Jaguar. Um, and, and they do pretty much all their product development and testing using digital simulation with, with, without any or, or really minimizing um, physical tests. And so really you can see that the quote from Jaguar there, um, how, how they've really managed to do things much faster um, going to digital simulation. And so Star achieves all this by really kind of delivering on, on, on six key elements. So, so realism with physics that kind of covers really everything you might want to do. And um, productivity with repeatable workflows um, really makes things much more efficient when you, when you need to redo things. Um, high performance computing um, with, with appropriate licensing that goes with it. Um, innovation on, on the optimization and, and op automation side um, for, for real um, very, very advanced optimization tools. Um, and then responsiveness with, with support and, and, and a very um, aggressive de development schedule. And then, and then lastly, the, the, the full range of support that you get from both ATA primarily and, and also from Siemens really leverages the, the quality of the tools. And so when you look in a little more detail of, of the, the, the realism in Star CCM Plus, you know, real world, real world engineering problems do not separate themselves into convenient categories. Um, such as aerodynamics or hydrodynamics. Um, we need simulation tools that really span a multitude of those, those disciplines um, and a variety of, of engineering and physical phenomena. So in order to actually capture all of those physics, um, Star CCM Plus gives you these, these very diverse set of physics that can really capture everything you might want to do. Um, and so the main thing is it's, it's an integrated environment that, that lets you um, tackle any physics that might come down the pike and offers both finite element and finite volume within the framework. And so as you can see, Star CCM Plus can, can help you cover application scope in a, in a single user interface by a broad range of validated models um, for, for various physics. Um, and you can see here, rotorcraft, automotive, turbines, um, marine, um, and electromagnetic, and all the way down on the right to, to combustion and, and in cylinder flows. Um, and so it's really, this is just a snapshot of, of the the kind of things that Star CCM Plus can deliver. On the productivity front, no matter how realistic um, a simulation is, the results are only useful if they're generated with sufficient time to influence the, and guide the final product design. And so this is only possible when the simulation process is, is robust and automated. Um, and, and Star CCM Plus really enables every simulation model to be built using this repeatable and robust workflow. Um, and really lets models be easily reused and updated to investigate a full range of, of design configurations and operating scenarios with, with minimal man, manual effort. And, that, and that's key to the Star CCM Plus efficiency. Um, so simulation models can be um, even be templated and allowing best practices to be easily shared you know, with other employees and across the whole organization. And, and Star CCM Plus is easy to use and even for advanced correct configuration physics. So there's no need to compromise between usability and functionality. I mean, features are fully um, parametric 3D feature-based modeler and can be linked with CAD and PLM software. So geometry updates are automatically presented in the simulation. And it uses an, a single scripting language, which, which is Java or JavaScript, that allows you to completely automate your workflow, customize the experience, and really set up a step-by-step -step process, process with, with simulation assistance. And so start ECM Plus, can, can really offer very high efficiency through, through high performance computing. Um, it's been developed with, with parallel scalability um, and really can scale up to a thousand cores. Um, and really offers a lot of licensing to really leverage licensing options to give you parallel cores in the cloud or, or really anywhere. So POD licensing that the Trek uses here has been a really great value for them to actually accelerate their design processes. Again, going back with the earlier mentioned templating for, for bicycle and, 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 and simulation optimization for, for bicycle frames. And then, and then lastly, with, with design exploration, really with, with being able to create a template-based optimization method, Star CCM Plus allows for this really rapid design and exploration and optimization. And, and, the, and part of the tool is called Design Manager. It really enables users to set up and parametric studies within Star CCM Plus, including process management, and, and performance assessment um, to evaluate families of designs. And it leverages really the all-in-one platform of Star CCM Plus 
um, to, to automate pipelines, for, for meshing, simulation, and pretty much the whole process can, can be automated. And, and then users can take it one step further um, and use Star CCM Plus Innovate, which actually, these are animated, so let's run them here, which, which let the users really create um, automated optimization workflows to, to home in on, on far better design. Um, and so on, on the right side of the screen, you can see how Airbus used Star the Innovate, which is the optimization tool. And to optimize the design of a, of a mixing component in, in environmental control systems. And by creating a parameterized CAD model of, of a mixer with various degrees of freedom, um, engineers are able to, to leave Star Innovate to navigate through over 250 designs to, to find a, a set of options providing vastly improved temperature uniformity across the duct. So um, th this really got them to a point which would have been almost impossible with, with, with manual steps. And so finally, Star, Star comes with obviously a, a, a set of, of world-class support teams. ATA provides full support for Star CCM Plus, and, and also Siemens do at, at a more deeper level. So, in, in addition to the, the 24/7 customer portal, gives you around-the-clock access to a wealth of information and, and various forms, including knowledge-based articles and technical forms to exchange ideas and other user issues. And even downloads of the new versions of, of the software are available there. And so basically with that, I think I'll pass you over to Damien. Are, are you there, Damien? I am indeed. Thank, uh, well, thank you everyone again for attending today's seminar, uh, webinar. Um, I'm going to talk about how ATA Engineering applied advanced CSD methods in Star CCM Plus to support GMTO and design of the thermal control system for the Giant Magellan Telescope. Uh, as Adam just said, my name is Damien Vanderpool. I am a senior project engineer at ATA, uh, and I focus on thermal and fluid dynamic analysis. Today's presentation was a project performed by ATA for our customer GMTO. So before I begin, I'd like to state that everything I'm presenting today is, uh, is you know, based on the public domain. Uh, we presented this work in the Thermal and Fluid Analysis Workshop last year in 2017. Uh, and a second disclaimer I'd like to quickly make on behalf of GMTO uh, that ATA's presentation today does not constitute or imply an endorsement of any particular software tools, methods, or even file design by GMTO. Uh, that is, today's presentation is made on behalf of ATA Engineering. We are subcontractors who perform engineering services for many industries, including aerospace and defense, and GMTO is an important customer of ours. So with that being said, let's get to it. So. Um, I first want to give a little introduction of what exactly the Giant Magellan Telescope is and how it works. So it's a land-based telescope that will allow humans to see further and deeper into space than ever before. Uh, its final destinations will be in the remote mountains of Chile. Uh, so the way it works is that light will reflect off of an array of primary mirrors, um, totaling uh, a total diameter of about 28 meters. Um, and then that will reflect and then go to a secondary set of mirrors, which will then focus it again on a camera that is at the center of the primary mirror array for calculation. So that kind of il illustrated by those red dash lines you see on the bottom right. Um, each large mirror is a single piece of borosilicate glass that is molded into a honeycomb pattern. It has about a two inch flat base and a two inch parabolic front face that is polished to within one millionth of an inch. Uh, to put that in context, uh, according to Google, Mount Everest is 29,029 feet high. Uh, and the question is, how accurate do you think that is? You know, do you think that's within a third of an inch? Because that's how precise this mirror has to be, relatively speaking. So it's extremely precise. And it has to be in order to see so deep into space. So the mirror's shape uh, and smoothness is pivotal for it to work properly. Um, therefore, even the slightest thermal distortion, or you know, potato chipping, if you will, of the mirror will prevent the telescope from taking accurate measurements. So to prevent this, a thermal control system consisting of nozzles, heat exchangers, and fans uh, is implemented. And today's presentation is going to go over how ATA used CSD to model the thermal control system and allow us to explore alternative designs. So in order to understand the thermal control system, uh, one must understand how the mirror looks like. Uh, so you know, each mirror, as I said, is a single piece of glass with a thick two-inch base and uh, a flat two-inch base and about a parabolic uh, two-inch front base. And those two faces are connected 
via thin walls uh, in the shape of hexagons. And so the air cavities within these hexagons are known as the cores. Uh, and there's about, there's exactly 1,681 cores in a single mirror. Uh, as you can see in the design drawing on, on the top there. Um, moreover, each core has a hole in the back space to allow air to enter and exit. In other words, to allow for convection to take place. So that's the mirror, and the mirror sits on the mirror assembly. So the mirror assembly consists of the mirror, uh, a weldment, the actuators connecting the two, and the thermal control system. So the mirror rests atop the weldment via the actuators, uh, and the space between the mirror and weldment is known as the upper plenum. Uh, the weldment itself is a giant box, and the air volume within that box is known as the lower plenum. So what happens, you see here in the schematic on the left, air is drawn from the upper plenum uh, through, a through a duct by a fan, and that fan then forces the air through heat exchangers and into the lower plenum. The heat exchangers regulate the air temperature as it enters the lower plenum, and then eventually pressure builds, and air is forced out of the lower plenum through the mirror nozzle, uh, which then connect the lower plenum to the mirror cores. So air is exit the mirror nozzles and pinch upon the interior surface of the mirror to cool or to, uh, to convect within the core. And then the only means for air to escape the core is through that hole in the bottom, and then it escapes that back into the upper plenum, and then the cycle repeats itself. So this is the closed loop thermal control system. So this slide goes over the methodology that was used to quantify and optimize a thermal control system. Essentially, uh, the GMT is in a giant closed room during the day, and then once it's night and they want to take measurements, they open these huge, these large doors to allow the GMT to see space. Uh, when this happens, external air rushes in, and if this air is at a different temperature than the GMT, you get localized natural convection cells over the top surface of the mirror, and that can cause problems with the optics. So GMT needs to be at the, the GMT needs to be at the same temperature as the ambient air at all times to avoid these natural convection cells. Um, and in fact, with legacy telescopes, uh, the thermal control system must often operate for at least an hour or so before the telescope is at a close enough temperature to the ambient air to allow measurements to be taken. And obviously with each hour that it's not used to record data is an hour wasted in a night. So it's of utmost importance that the telescope is as quickly as possible at the same temperature as ambient air. So to do that, we would need to minimize the thermal time constant uh, as much as possible. Similarly, as I mentioned before, with the uh, polishing of one millionth of an inch, even a single degree of temperature difference between one portion of the mirror and another can result in enough thermal distortion to prevent accurate measurements. So besides for having a small thermal time constant, a uniform thermal time constant is desired as well. So as a result, our end goal is to come up with a design that provides as uniform and as small of a thermal time constant as possible. So this was done by the following. So first we take CAD of the structural model and we create a breakout models of single cores. Uh, then from that CAD, we perform CFD analysis of the breakout models when varying multiple parameters. And then the output of these CFD analyses were heat transfer coefficient numbers which we then use to develop new slope number correlations so that we can have heat transfer coefficients for all surfaces of all cores, not just the ones that we analytically derive from CFP. Um, moreover, we determine the float network of the entire uh, thermal control system, uh, and we need a CFD for a variety, of re a variety of portions of that as well. So the flow network consists of pressure drops between different stations, right? We have the lower plenum, then it goes to the core, then it goes to the upper plenum, et cetera. Um, the pressure drop across certain stations can be easily determined via manufacturer's data specs or even textbooks, but some pressure drops had to be simulated by CFD. So star CCM plus was used for that as well. Uh, then once we had a new number of correlations and the flow network, uh, there were several input parameters that we wanted to vary uh, that were not quite known at the time uh, and for the design. For example, uh, the exact part number that was used for the fan was still unknown. And so we wanted to make, uh, to solve this problem for any number of fans that might exist. Moreover, there were 
any number of fans that we can use, um, between 40 to 60, let's say, in the entire thermal control system per mirror. Um, and then finally, the baseline design uh, for the legacy telescopes that use the same thermal control system was to have a single sized mirror nozzle for each core. And by that, I mean the mirror nozzle was the same length and diameter for every single core uh, in the mirror. Uh, but since the cores vary in height as you go radially outward, that means you know, the mirror nozzle might not be ideal for core X if it is for core Y. Uh, so because of that, we wanted to also have an input of assuming um, how many different types of mirror nozzles can we have in a design to minimize our thermal time cost. So we put all of that into a script, and the script then outputted the heat transfer coefficients for all surfaces um, in the mirror, and then that was used then as an input along the thermal boundary condition to a thermal model. Uh, the thermal model was run for a specific locates, and then we had temperature versus time on the surface of the mirror. We then used that to calculate the actual thermal time constants for all phases of heat transfer, convection, conduction, radiation, et cetera. And we use that to compare and make sure that we were uh, meeting the design needs. So with that being said, let's talk about the workflow explicitly in STAR CCM Plus. So as I mentioned, we originally started with a structural CAD that was imported into STAR. We edited the CAD, um, manipulated it so that we could have a air volume breakout model. We then mesh that air, uh, mesh that breakout model, uh, and analyze it for a variety of conditions. And then from that, we were outputted surface area average heat transfer coefficients, and then use those to derive Newton number correlations, as well as to calculate an estimated thermal time constant uh, based solely on convection which since this cooling system was uh, dominated by forced convection, that gave us a good estimate of what to expect of thermal time constants once we analyze a thermal model, which accounted for all phases of heat transfer. So this slide goes into kind of more detail about the CAD manipulation that you can do in STAR CCM Plus. So as I mentioned, the original CAD was structural, which means you know, no air volumes were explicitly modeled in the CAD. So in STAR, you're able to bring in CAD and edit it yourself. Um, so in that, we essentially cut out the portions of the mirror we did not want. We were able to add in other parts of the CAD. For example, I added in the mirror nozzle. Um, so you can see in the picture on the left, it's already broken out. Uh, a single core is broken out from the rest of the mirror, but there's no mirror nozzle present. Uh, and then in the picture on the right is the air volume, because you can also do Boolean operations in STAR. And so I created a mirror nozzle and then did a boiling operation. So the picture on the right is just the air within a single core as well as within that mirror nozzle. You're also allowed to have uh, design parameters so that you can easily just change a single value and your entire CAD and breakout model will update accordingly. So by this, we were able to analyze multiple mirror nozzle lengths and diameters for a single core with just a change of one or two parameters. Uh, and so the way to easily uh, optimize and easily parameterize your, your model to perform multiple analyses as quickly and as easily as possible. So with that, we developed a couple of breakout models for the, um, for the original design. So the first, what we called core, uh, is kind of what I just showed in the slide before. It explicitly modeled all of the air within the core and the mirror nozzle itself. Um, but we also developed a, a second breakout model we called core plus a UP fan and then for upper plenum. Uh, and so this model explicitly still explicitly models a single mirror nozzle in its core, but also models all other uh, annuli corresponding to all other cores um, centered around a single fan. Uh, the reason why we did this is that with this model, we can also account for the heat transfer coefficients on the external back surface of the mirror because all of that air and the upper plenum is circulating as it, as it shoots out of the, a core and then circulates in the upper plenum before it finally enters a fan, a, a fan duct. And that circulation can also cool the mirror on the back surface of the mirror itself. So this core plus UP fan uh, allows us to determine the heat transfer coefficients on all surfaces internal to the core, but as well as the external surface on the back of the core centered around a single fan. 
So given that, uh, this slide talks about just the uh, CFT parameters used in Star CCM Plus. Uh, you know, it's all pretty basic. I'll just skim through it pretty quickly. Uh, the 3D steady state single phase gas flow, a uh, segregated flow. Uh, we use the k epsilon turbulence model with ideal gas wall. We ignored gravity, so there's no natural convection. Uh, we did spot checks to confirm that the, uh, this was a good assumption, but since this model is dominated by forced convection, uh, the answers were the same. Uh, so in terms of the mesh continua, we did a surface remesher. We used a polyhedral mesh and we added prism layers. Um, the parameters for the prism layers were defined such that we would have boundary layers that would result in a Y plus value between one and 10 for all surfaces of interest. Uh, the mesh count itself really ranged depending on which breakout model and which model, uh, which near nozzle size we're using, but it was anywhere between a half a million to 13 and a half million cells. Uh, I consistently use 32 cores because we have an HPC capability for star CDM plus, and it would have each breakout analysis would have about a CPU time of around 32 core hours, which means about one and a half, 1.6 wall clock hours per iteration. Uh, and this was obviously several thousand iterations uh, before, you know, uh, we had a, uh, had a solution that I deemed converge and acceptable. So this slide here uh, talks about and shows some of the post-processing and uh, outputs you can get in, in Star Season Plus and how it really helped us identify how to uh, quantify and optimize the, the uh, thermal control system. So we have heat transfer coefficients uh, contours on the surfaces of the, um, of the near core itself. And we also are uh, tracking the air via particles. And the air particles themselves actually have their own contours of temperature. So you can see you know, air comes in uh, at a cold temperature and pinches on the top surface of the near core and where it heats up and then travels down along the sides of the core before it finally exits to the annulus in the bottom. Uh, the picture on the right is the same thing, but now this is for the core plus UP uh, fan model. And what we see here is that you know the air is leaving the, annu the other annuli as well as just the core we explicitly modeled, and then all going into the fan as well. And also from this, you can see that we have heat transfer coefficients on the what I was calling the external back surface of the mirror itself, which is this red orangish color you see here. So from this, we were able to get surface area average heat transfer coefficients on the different surfaces of interest. Now, as you may remember, I mentioned that the front of the mirror is about two inches thick, and the back of the mirror is about two inches thick. And so that's pretty much the bulk of the mirror in terms of mass. Uh, so we really wanted the thermal time constant on the front and the back to be as low and uniform as possible. Well, the air, the, con the convection, you get on the top surface, which we have highlighted here in red, is pretty much all due to impinging flow. So we found a surface area average of all of this as a single value. Uh, for the back surface, it was different types of flow um, that can occur. For example, on the interior side, we see here, it's just kind of like flow over a flat plate, whereas on back here, it's internal duct annular flow. And then the back surface is a different type. So we calculated the heat transfer coefficient value for each specific set. That way we can develop a corresponding Newton number for each specific set. Um, and then based off of that, we were actually also able to predict a thermal time constant based purely on convection uh, so that we can kind of anticipate that, hey, this particular setup of a mirror nozzle will result in a low and uni uniform thermal time constant for the top as well as for the bottom. Now, once we got those neutral numbers, uh, we plugged into the script, as I mentioned, and then that outputted heat transfer coefficients for all surfaces of the mirror. Uh, we then uh, could plug that into our thermal model. Uh, and our thermal model was just a, a 2D uh, and 1D um, finite difference solver. Uh, and we were able to, you know, for that one, we modeled the entire mirror assembly, including the weldment and uh, actuators and everything else. And you know, this has shown how the mirror looks like in the thermal model, where you have the weldment in gray, blue is the parabolic top surface of the mirror, uh, the magenta is the flat bottom surface of the mirror. You can see all those holes, those are those core holes I was talking about. 
And then the green is just all of the um, thin side sides of the mirror that connect the top and the bottom. So the first run we did was for the baseline design. As I mentioned, the legacy uh, telescopes that use the thin thermal control system had a single nozzle dot length and diameter for all cores. And also remember that the fun face of the mirror is parabolic, so as you go regularly outward, your cores get taller and taller. When that happens, a certain mirror nozzle uh, will have less efficient impinging flow on that top surface as the cores get taller and taller. So that's essentially what you see in the top, the, the left of the picture. Uh, the few things to note, uh, first is all these kind of red triangles. Uh, what happens here is that, as I mentioned before, uh, there are actuators that hold up the mirror above the weldment. And these are basically large triangular, you know, tripods, if you will, uh, that hold up the mirror, and they block the core holes uh, for, the, for those mirror cores. So you're, we're unable to have mirror nozzles into the cores that are blocked by these actuators. And since forced convection is the main means of heat transfer in this problem, those cores cool down uh, far less quickly than other cores. So this thermal model, uh, uh, the way it works is that the, the mirror was initially at 13 degrees Celsius, and then at T equals zero, uh, we assume the doors open, air comes in, so you have external air at 11 degrees, plus a radiation sky sink that the mirror sees. And then you have the thermal control system pumping in 11 degree, uh, 11 degree uh, Celsius air into the cores. So after one hour, you have the top surface at the middle of the mirror closer to 11 degrees than you do as you go regularly outward due to that single nozzle phenomenon I was mentioning earlier. Uh, moreover, what you see is that the bottom surface of the mirror um, has a uniform temperature since it's flat. But this temperature in general is, you know, somewhere between obviously the coldest and the hottest of the top uh, surface. Converting this into thermal time constants in terms of minutes, which is the picture here on the right, you, you see the same phenomenon where the thermal time constant at the top of the mirror and uh, the center is maybe around 20, to 20 minutes or so. But as you go regularly outward, it gets well above 60. Moreover, in the bottom, it's uniform, but that uniform is somewhere in the 30 to 40 minute range. So, you know, we have a non-uniform and not necessarily lowest thermal time constant here for the baseline design. And this was qualitatively the same that was seen in the legacy telescope. This is the reason why we were, uh, we wanted to analyze this and attempt to optimize the design. So that was a good sanity check that, hey, everything we're doing is, is exactly what is seen um, in reality. So, because of the fact that there was a non-uniform and not necessarily the lowest thermal time constant, we needed to optimize the design. So the picture here in the top right is kind of representation of the, the baseline. All those green arrows represent mirror nozzles and they're all kind of the same height. So you can see if you go right to the outward, there's a big gap between the tip of the green arrow and the top surface of the mirror. So, uh, you know, we, we attempted to optimize the design by having different size mirror nozzles as you go right to the outward. You know, obviously it would be ideal if each 1,681 cores would have its unique mirror nozzle, but that would be manufacturing uh, you know, a big headache in terms of practicality and manufacturability. So uh, we wanted to, you know, have a reasonable number of mirror nozzle lengths and diameters and see if we could have this, uh, the same thermal time constant everywhere. Uh, as it turns out, that was a, a difficult ask because uh, essentially the thermal time constant on the front side of the mirror and the back side of the mirror were highly coupled. Uh, since obviously as the mirror nozzle gets closer and closer to the top surface, you have far more effective cooling on the top surface. Uh, but then at the expense of having that air slow down dramatically by the time it gets to the bottom surface. Um, and so what we here at ATA uh, proposed was a, what we call an upper plenum nozzle design in which we use the optimized design of multiple mirror nozzles uh, that we were originally planning, but we added these new nozzles, what we're calling upper plenum nozzles, that would connect the lower plenum air and stop just short of the mirror itself and essentially have impinging flow on the back face of the mirror. That way, the original nozzles, the mirror nozzles, 
can be used solely to, um, to optimize the thermal time constant on the front face of the mirror, and the upper component nozzles can be used to optimize the thermal time constant on the back face of the mirror, we can decouple those two thermal time constants. So in order to do this, we had to make a new breakout model. Uh, this is what we call the core plus upper penum um, model. As you can kind of see, it explicitly models a single core as done before, and it models uh, a section of the, of the upper plenum nozzle, sorry, a section of the upper plenum uh, in this hexagon shape you see here, and it has some upper plenum nozzles that connect the lower plenum to the upper plenum. Uh, and those have impingement flow on the back face of the mirror. So here now shows again the results that we, I showed before. In fact, the picture on the left is literally the same one as I showed a few slides ago. And the picture on the right is the same for the, upper, the optimized upper plenum nozzle design. And the thing I want to point out here is that the contour color of the heat transfer coefficient here on the picture on the left is somewhere in the blue to yellowish range, which means it's a larger heat transfer coefficient. And you compare that to, let's say, the contour color here on the back face of the, um, of the mirror, and it's more red to orange which means the lower heat transfer coefficient. The importance of that is with the difference in heat transfer coefficients, you're gonna have a difference in thermal time constants. But this is the issue we were having with the original optimized design. Whereas here on the right, we have heat transfer coefficient being in the yellowish color, you know, on an average for the top surface. And as you see here, the back surface of the mirror, it's also yellowish. Uh, so what we see here is that we expect to have the same surface area average heat transfer coefficient, which means we'll have the, roughly the same thermal time constant, which is exactly what we want for our design. And after running through the script and running a the thermal model, we see exactly that. So this is the temperature contour after one hour, exactly as what I showed before for the baseline design. And what hopefully you'll notice is that the temperature on the top and bottom surface is a nice blue color, besides for the areas where uh, no mirror nozzles can be present through the actuators. And not only that, but the blue color is the same as you go radially outward, and it's the same for the top surface and the bottom surface. Uh, converting that to thermal time constants, uh, again, the same scale as before, uh, you see that we are this light shade of blue essentially everywhere. So if you remember on the baseline, the, the bottom was kind of 30 to 40, um, minutes in terms of thermal time constant, whereas now it's definitely in the, you know, 15, 20, 25 range. There were, and this goes for the top and the bottom. Remember the top was even more or uh, less uniform with somewhere in the 20s in the center and over 60 as you go right to the hour. So what we did with this upper plenum proposed design is that we were able to reduce the overall bulk average thermal time constant by about a factor of two and increase the uniformity by about a factor of five. So this slide goes and shows the, uh, you know, the comparison kind of so you can see on the same slide the results that I'm talking about. On the right, there's uh, the baseline design, and on the left, there was the optimized UP design. You can see that difference in color and uniformity in the thermal time constants. Moreover, in the picture, again, it's showing the contours and streamlines this time since it's not an animation. Uh, and you can see the, the color of yellowish on the back surface of the mirror here, as well as yellowish on the front surface of the mirror here, uh, as well as just the path that the air particles take as they go from the mirror nozzle and every point of nozzle and so forth. Whereas here in the baseline, you had kind of a yellowish orange to red, red, red. So it's definitely a different uh, heat transfer coefficient here or the more uniform version here. So, with that, it brings us to the end of the presentation. And to summarize, uh, so we, we analyzed uh, and produced results for the baseline design that qualitatively uh, matched that of the legacy telescopes. I say qualitatively because we did not have data to quantitatively compare our results uh, to the test. But uh, from everyone that was there and observed the phenomenon, it, it very much matched what was seen in reality. We then uh, created a new optimized UPN design which, uh, which we suggested and then dramatically increased the performance of thermal control in the system. Uh, and so we used star CCM plus for the bulk of this work and it was great because uh, it allowed for the ATA team to easily and quickly manipulate complex CAD 
uh, solve on the cluster within you know an hour or hour or so, and post process everything we need to not only have the information we need quickly and easily to understand, but it, we were able to post process enough to uh, to understand the actual physical phenomena occurring, so that we can use that to drive our optimization um, in the future. So all of that goes to show you know how it, how Star Citizen Plus was used and how it greatly helped us in this particular project. Um, now I'd like to open the floor to any questions, if there are any. Um, and yeah, Jonathan, I guess go ahead and unmute people if they have any questions. All right, this is Adam. It looks like um, there's no questions, so we appreciate you listening today, um, and we'll we'll wrap up the webinar. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye.